Nanyam gunabhyas kart Nanyam gunabhyas kart haram Nanyam pashati Gunabhyas shaparam veti Madhavam so digachati Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada when one properly sees that in all activities no other performer is at work than these modes of nature, and he knows the Supreme Lord who is transcendental to all these modes, he attains my spiritual nature. Shukhar's purport. One can transcend the, all the activities in the modes of material nature simply by understanding them properly, by learning from the proper souls. The real spiritual master is Krishna, and he is imparting this spiritual knowledge to Arjuna. Similarly, it is from those who are fully in Krishna consciousness that one has to learn the science of activities in terms of the modes of material nature, modes of nature. Otherwise, one's life will be misdirected. By the instruction of a bona fide spiritual master, a living entity can know of his spiritual position, his material body, his senses, how he is entrapped, and how he is under the spell of the material modes of nature. He is helpless, being in the grip of these modes. But when he can see his real position, then he can attain to the transcendental platform, having the scope for spiritual life. Actually, the living entity is not the performer of different activities. He is forced to act because he is situated in a particular type of body, conducted by some particular mode of material nature. Unless one has the help of spiritual authority, he cannot understand in what position he is actually situated. With the association of a bona fide spiritual master, he can see his real position. And by such an understanding, he can become fixed in full Krishna consciousness. A man in Krishna consciousness is not controlled by the spell of the material modes of nature. It has already been stated in the seventh cant chapter that one who has surrendered to Krishna is relieved from the activities of material nature. One who is able to see things as they are, the influence of material nature gradually ceases. Nanyan gunebhyas kartaram yadadrashtan upashiti gunebhyas chaparam veti madhvavam so digachiti One can see that the... When one properly sees that in all activities no other performers at work than these modes of nature, and he knows the Supreme Lord who is transcendental to all these modes, he attains my spiritual nature. Namam Vishnu Vraya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutta Shri Mate Bhaktivedanta Swainti Namane Namaste Sarasutum Deve Gauravani Bhajarane Nirvi Shesha Shrinivadi Paskatya Desatarne Prabhupada explains in this verse what the role of, the, of a spiritual master is. Generally, the actual spiritual master is Krishna. There are two verses in Chaitanya Charitamrita that define shiksha and diksha. As Uddhava, when Krishna was speaking to Uddhava, Krishna says, Acharyamam vijaniyam Nava manyate karhichit. Namartya buddhya suyeta sarva deva maya guru. That one should know the acharya is my very self. One should not dis disrespect him, thinking him to be an ordinary person because the acharya is a representative of all the demigods. And then, shiksha guru ke ta krishnera sarup. Antaryami bhakti shesta edu rup. I want you to know the the <coughs> Krishna as the super soul, actually the Shiksha Guru to be a representative of Krishna. That Krishna appears as the super soul and as the best of the devotees. So there are different kinds of gurus, but ultimately Shiksha. Diksha, there is real no difference. 
both of them are supposed to give us vision. If we take a Diksha Guru or a Shiksha Guru and we wind up with the same vision we had before we accepted their instructions, then it's called Shrama A.V. Kevala. We're just wasting our time. If we don't see things as they are, as Krishna sees things, at least theoretical. Now, of course, the problem is we may have a class and suddenly we see everything perfectly and then we walk out of the class and we go back to our same vision again. <laughs> the same material desires, the same material conceptions, the same material activities, punak punas charavita charavanana. Therefore, in the beginning, we had to be taught how to learn. Because if we don't learn how to learn, we'll never learn. And one thing is that we have to learn how to hear. And as it says in the, in the Bhagavatam, one has to hear with rapt attention. But no one can hear with rapt attention if the mind is not controlled. And the mind cannot be controlled unless we're regulated in our eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. So we're trying to regulate our material conceptions, our material desires, our material false ego, so that we perform service to Krishna in whatever we're doing, whether it be eating or sleeping or even mating or defending. It all should be done in Krishna's service so that our mind is completely focused on service to Krishna. Then we, can, we might be able to hear with rapt attention. And if we hear with rapt attention, then the result should be is that we should actually see what we're hearing. And if we don't see what we're hearing, then we're blind. And if we're blind, andaya tandir upigayamanas te pisha tantra urudami bada. Then whatever we're doing will be in the material world and we'll simply come to another material circumstance. Therefore, we have to learn how to hear in such a way as that we actually remember what we're hearing. If we can't remember what we're hearing, that means we're not really listening. In the spiritual world, when Rarani, Shimati Rarani teaches Rati some verse, she memorizes it immediately because she has nothing else to do. There's no distraction. Her only desire is to serve Shimati Rarani, and therefore she's not distracted by, you know, What's on the internet? Is her iPhone working? What's her prashadam? Does she actually love me? Does he love me? There's no distraction. And therefore, when in the spiritual world, when one hears something, one automatically fully experiences it. And if we experience it, then we won't forget it. If we hear something and we don't experience it, then it's a waste of time. Of course, it's not a waste of time, but we should keep on hearing until we actually at least remember it. And then after remembering it, then we have to see what it's, what's being said. And more important than what's being said is that how it applies to my life so that I can apply it within my life and actually experience it. Unless we ex apply it with it, we, we get a little experience when we remember it and we see it. And we get a much greater experience when we not only remember it, but we see it and we apply it in our lives in a practical way in devotional service to Krishna and his devotees. So we experience it and then we'll actually remember it. Then it becomes part of our experience. That's called faith. If we read the books and we get some realization, that's the beginning of faith. But then we have to apply it. And then we, especially in the loving exchanges with the devotees and with Krishna and with the innocent and with the non-devotees, and then the dami buddhi yogam tam. Krishna will give us the intelligence to experience it. 
Matter of fact, he'll give us the intelligence so that he reveals himself to us and we experience him, plus everyone and everyone else in relationship to him. Therefore, for one who can see things as they are, uh, so the job of any spiritual master, and indeed, everyone is supposed to be a spiritual master. It's not that there is 80 or 90 people in ISKCON who have a vision and everyone else is a blind. If that's the case, then everyone's gonna, most 99.9% .9 of the devotees in ISKCON being blind will fall into a ditch. No, everyone, if the devotee is actually powerful in Krishna consciousness, if we actually have bona fide spiritual masters, whether diksha or shiksha, then they can't be blind. You can't be blind and claim yourself to be a bona fide spiritual master. Otherwise, what is the meaning of being a bona fide spiritual master if you don't see the same thing that your, your spiritual master saw? If you think your spiritual master in the Acharya and Disciple Succession had his vision and now he's dead and gone and now I have my vision, well, then your vision is disruptive. It's neither Krishna's vision, nor the Acharya's vision, nor reality. It's simply a different mode of material nature that you're experiencing in the name of reality. Therefore, it's the job of everyone to develop their, own, their vision by strictly following the orders of Krishna and the Supreme Succession by studying in such a way as to find out what they are. Most devotees don't realize, especially under the present system of ISKCON, where we've added more upadis than we had before. Generally, one is born in ignorance and he thinks himself to be the body and he identifies himself with being Indian or male or female or Russian or American or black or white or red or yellow, whatever. One thinks rich or poor. One has so many material designations. And then you join this kind and you find out you're not that you're a body, that all these designations are false, except for you're initiated by such and such devotee and now you belong to a very small section of devotees who are really devotees and everyone else is a quasi-devotee. <laughs> because they're not really understanding who the real devotee is because we realize that the person who initiated and what he's giving is the truth and everyone else is giving part of the truth. And when they realize the truth, they'll get reinitiated by my spiritual master so they can find out the real truth. So in such a mentality, one is simply in the material conception of life, and instead of being free, well not free, instead of developing the intelligence, how to see every living entity, beginning with the Vaishnavas, the devotees, or even the inspiring devotees, in relationship to Krishna as my object of service, not that I serve my god brothers and sisters when I have to, and everyone else I avoid them, because they may ask me to do something and I don't want them to offend me. No, we have to actually develop a vision to see everyone as Krishna's eternal servant, and appropriately, according to their level of spiritual advancement, serve them appropriately to those who are expert at unalloyed, uninterrupted service, then we become, we serve them carefully, with care and attention, because in that way we can actually hear from them. If we don't hear from them, if we don't serve them appropriately, then the result is we won't be able to hear from them. In the back of our minds we'll be thinking, well, he's not my initiating spiritual master, so what does he know? I didn't take initiation from him. I don't have to serve him. If I had to serve all the devotees, I would be busy all day long. I wouldn't be able to do whatever I want to do. It would be a big impediment to actually accept reality. 
So I accept this devotee as a bona fide spiritual master and I serve him once in a while as far as his instructions. It's not really necessary that I remember his instructions because he's so merciful, he's going to bring me back to Godhead no matter what I do. He's already accepted my sinful reactions and he's even better than Jesus Christ because he'll keep on accepting them more and more and more. And at the end, he brings me back to Goloka Vrindavan, although most of the time he has to spend in the hospital absorbing my sinful reactions. So this mentality is simply illusory. It has nothing to do with what Rupa Goswami says in Nectar of Instruction. Uh, we actually have to read these books carefully, and that's called Shravana Dasa. And then Varna Dasa means we accept what it says. And even if the whole of ISKCON has a completely different view, we're divided up into 90 different camps or 300 different camps, all depending on who you're initiated by. That my spiritual master has thousands of disciples and yours only has a few hundred, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> Obviously, he's not very powerful because he can't attract people not only that, he's so strict that how can anyone love him? He rejects the innocent without any feeling. But my guru is so soft-hearted, anyone who comes by, he gives them initiation. So this kind of thought and mentality is not very good. We may have liberal devotees, we may have not so liberal devotees. But initiation is not simply a question of joining a camp. It's a question of giving up our false ego. If we don't give up our false ego at the time of initiation, then initiation has no meaning. We remain in the material conception of life. And the bona fide spiritual masters, they teach how to serve the devotees without falsely giving them designations, serving them because they're devotees or aspiring to become devotees and serving them appropriate. That's what the bona fide spiritual master gives. And that's what Prabhupada gives in his books. So whatever we think, whatever we think our, our authorities are giving us, but that's the, that's the vision of Srila Rupa Goswami, that's the vision of Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas to go, that's why Prabhupada went from India to the Western world, not to make American devotees and Chinese devotees, to make devotees. And that's why he came back to India, not to make Indian devotees, but to make devotees. Unless we become devotees, unless we give up our false designations and serve the devotees and serve Krishna without material conce concepts, and the loving exchanges, then we'll simply remain on the material platform. Unless we're inspired to create a family of devotees, then why will we invite anyone else into the family? So that they can, we drag them so they become part of my, my guru gives them initiation, rather than this other half guru gives them initiation. No, it's not a competition who you're going, we're going to get initiated by. It's a competition of who's going to become the best loving servant of Krishna and the devotees. That should be the competition. Then our movement will make progress. Otherwise, we'll simply fight over insignificant things. And instead of exchanging loving exchanges with the devotees, we'll simply sometimes get it right and do some service. And most of the time, we'll simply be offending most of the devotees. And the result of that is that we'll lose our taste for studying these books. If we can't act as devotees, how will we understand Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is simply based on loving exchanges between the devotees? How will we understand Srimad Bhagavatam? How Krishna is reciprocating with his devotees and how the devotees are reciprocating with each other? They'll simply remain theoretical. There'll be one existence in the Bhagavatam, one existence in Chaitanya Charitamrita, and one existence in Iskhan. And of course, Iskhan is much more, you know, our vision is much more bona fide.
than Chaitanya Charitamrita and nectar of instruction, nectar of devotion. Uh, so we'll remain in ignorance, at least to some degree. We may practice the rituals of devotional service. We may even study the books. We may learn the shlokas. But if we offend the devotees, if we don't engage in loving service to the, them and under the directions of the superior devotees and Krishna within our heart, then we'll simply come back birth after birth after birth till the end of Kali Yuga. And then at the end of Kali Yuga, these little people will come and will be prasad. <laughs> we'll be appreciated greatly by these little people who will have us for the Sunday feast. <laughs> but that's not what we're here for. We should read these books and we should have some perspective of what it's all about. We're not just reading for the sake of reading so we can pass the test. You know, before I was, I was simply a bhakta or a bhaktin and then I, I followed whatever they told me until I could finally get initiated. And then I didn't have to do all this menial service anymore because the other bhaktas and bhaktins do it. So I graduated from menial service. I got a name. Excuse me, Prabhu, can you do this? Do you know who I am? Know who I am? I'm Krishna Das. Oh, I'm sorry, I should do it. <laughs> I'm bhakta so-and-so. You must do it. You're a bhakta. You must surrender for your own benefit. And then we, we get some, oh, bhakti shastri. I'm not an ordinary devotee. I'm a bhakti shastri. Did you pass the bhakti shastri test? No? Well, oh, you're in Maya Prabhu. You're in ignorance. <laughs> you must surrender to me and serve me faithfully. And then one day you'll be able to pass the Bhakti Shastri test. Not only that, but now I'm Bhakti Vedanta. I'm on the same level as Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada was Bhakti Vedanta, and I'm Bhakti Vedanta. The only difference is that I'm young and he was old. <laughs> so all these different conceptions are all false. They're all different gifts of Maya to keep us in, fault in the illusion of false prestige, rather than actually becoming more and more humble, because humility and love go together. If we're feeling proud of our material situation, that means our love is simply diminishing. Our love for Krishna and our love for our devotees, but our love for our false ego is greatly expanding. And at the, at the end of life, we'll think of all our romantic and other past, heroic pastimes, and we'll go to hell thinking about my Leela in the material world. <laughs> Rather than serving Krishna's Leela as a humble servant, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Krishna, they're humble. And unless we develop that humility, we'll never understand what's in the Bhagavatam, what's in Bhagavad Gita, any of the scriptures. And that humility means I have a false ego. I'm simply cultivating my false ego I'm not seeing the devotees as the object of my worship, and they're Krishna and service, and therefore Krishna is not giving me any intelligence how to serve them. And because I don't see any, I'm not developing the intelligence how to serve the devotees appropriately, therefore I'm, I'm serving them inappropriately, or I'm offending them. And the result of that is I don't realize anything. I just realize I memorize some slokas like a parrot, and the highlight of my day is not service to Krishna and his devotees, it's finally when I get to eat some prasadam. And then if it's an extra special day, I can go to sleep afterwards. So we're more devotees of our stomach than we are of Krishna and the devotees. So that we have to learn these books and see it from the whole perspective that it, we're reading these books to develop service to Krishna and his devotees. Not only to Krishna or his deity, but we're developing, trying to develop service to all the devotees. And if, indeed, by doing that, then we become inspired eventually to help innocent people also. It won't be, we won't see the innocent people as a burden. We'll see them as an opportunity to help bring them into Krishna's family. And then Krishna will be happy. In the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, 
Gov Kumara was told by Shmata Rarani to talk to this Brahmin. Actually, he was Sarup by that time. To, talk, to explain his whole history and help this Brahmin become Krishna conscious. So he had to leave Krishna's pastimes to help this Brahmin, but he, he was happy because he knew that Shemati Rarani would be pleased with him. So it's not that, oh my God, here comes the devotee, a new person, he looks hungry, maybe he's going to eat my prasadam. <laughs> Why should he bother me? I have so many other things to do. No, we should see it as an opportunity to actually please Krishna and Shemati Rarani, to please Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to help innocent people become conscious of Krishna. And if we do that, if we actually develop a taste for service and for love, because it's all service and love go together, humbly serving without trying to gain some false prestige, that one day my spiritual master will leave and then I can take his position and have so many followers. Then they'll cook for me, they'll, they'll wash my clothes, and they'll worship me, and then I won't have to worry about eating anymore. <laughs> That's not the goal of Krishna consciousness. The goal is to become a humble servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. And the more we develop love, that humble service attitude in proper consciousness, who we're serving and how to serve them, who's more advanced than me and how to serve more advanced devotees, how to serve those who are equal, I'm on the same level as myself, and how to respect those who are not, who are just on the threshold of Krishna consciousness. If we develop expertise and discrimination in that way, then we'll make spiritual advancement. Or otherwise, if we don't, then spiritual master is just, spiritual advancement is just a theory. We won't actually experience Krishna consciousness. And we won't experience the ecstasy that actually purifies our hearts so we can actually see what's taking place. So studying the books is not just an intellectual exercise. It's supposed to be applied so it becomes an experience, what's in the book. And if we're not experiencing what's in the book, then reading the book is simply going to be a waste of time. So I'll stop there, thank you. Any questions? Comments? How to understand that, you know, when his spiritual master is giving instruction, he is giving instruction according to his own experience. Yes. But for a condition so like us, it's difficult to accept it because we are not in the same status or in the same, you know, uh, same standard. Sometimes it's difficult, you know, what he's saying is right for me or, or it is wrong for me. How to understand this? Did everyone hear the question? The only way of understanding is with your intelligence. Unless we have a background in Prabhupada's books, we want to know what, what, what anyone is saying. Because we have to judge things in relation to Prabhupada's books. In other words, as Prabhupada writes in the uh, Nectar of uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita in the purport, Shiksha Guru Keta Krishnarya Sarup under Yami Bhakti Shesta Eduri Rup. That the <coughs> Shiksha Guru is the representative of Krishna. The super soul and the best of the devotees, Bhakti Shesta, they're manifestations of Krishna. So probably writes in the in the purport, there are two kinds of Shiksha Gurus. One of them is situated on the absolute platform and he sees everything perfectly because he's in love with Krishna. He's in love with, he sees everyone and everything in relationship to Krishna. He's perfectly situated in pure consciousness of Krishna. He sees exactly what's going on. Others may not be on that level. They may have some more subjective experience based upon their applying what they've heard from the Mahabhagavad. And therefore they get different levels of realization according to how consistently and how enthusiastically they're serving. Mahabhagava. So they'll give different visions. And when we hear them, if we can learn from them how to engage better in the loving service of Krishna and his devotees and help the innocent, 
and avoid the atheists, then we can get something valuable from them, if that's what they're explaining to us. And after hearing, we don't walk away with something valuable, how to increase our loving service to Krishna, increase our loving service appropriately to the devotees, increase our helping the innocent and becoming more detached from association with the, with the non-devotees, then the, the instructions, we, we won't be, we're not really gaining very much benefit. So we have to know what the field of activities is and therefore instructions. Just like if you want to learn some game, did you ever play a sport? What sport did you play? What's that? Cricket. Football is soccer. So soccer means you have to learn how to hit the ball with your foot, right? Or your head. So if you get instructions from, an, from a soccer player how to punch the ball with your hands and become expert at kicking the, the ball with your hands, then you're wasting your time because that's not allowed. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. So you have to learn from someone who knows how to play soccer and what's allowed. He may not be expert, but if he's more expert than you than kicking the ball, you've learned something. But if he tells you how to kick the ball with your, with your hands, I don't think you're allowed to do that, right? You can't punch the ball in soccer. Is that right? So then you're wasting your time. So we have to know what the field is, what's allowed and what's not allowed, and then we can learn from people who are more expert from us, even though they may not be completely 100% expert, we can learn how we can get better at it. But we have to know what, what the, what's allowed and what's not allowed. Privitim ja, nivritim ja, jana navidor, asaram, nisocham napichacharona, satyam teisham vidyate. Those who don't know what's to be done, or, or what's not to be done, neither cleanliness nor uh, truthfulness nor proper behavior is found in them. So we know have to know what, what the field is, then someone can help us become better at that field. Is that right? Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Is audible? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, thank you very much. Maharaj, uh, in here we learn uh, different skills and uh, techniques um, through Sanskrit grammar, how we can understand the verse properly and Bhakti Vedanta purport, also the Acharya's commentaries. So this uh, we learn, Bhagavatam, Slokas, all this. At the same time, as you said that one should have this applied knowledge. So the application point. So my question is that how to balance the between the learning the skills and reading the Acharya's commentaries, also the applications? Well, you have to see, you have to learn Prabhupada's books thoroughly. Otherwise, it's very unlikely we're going to have access to the previous acharyas. If we don't have, if we don't, can't have access to Prabhupada and what his teachings are, then it's very difficult to apply them within the ISKCON society. Of course, nowadays ISKCON society is so confused, we're not even so sure what ISKCON is anymore. There's so many different ideas floating around. In any case, Prabhupada is the Ashraya, is the founder of Acharya, and we have to have be based in his teaching, and then we have to understand the Acharya's teachings through Prabhupada, not that we understand Prabhupada through the Acharya's teachings. Then we'll miss, then neither the Acharya's nor Prabhupada nor anyone is going to be pleased with us. We may come up with some very unique intellectual conceptions that everyone's impressed by because no one understands what we're talking about, including the Acharyas and Prabhupada. <laughs> so we'll simply cultivate false prestige by doing that, like Vallabhacharya. No, we have to understand everything through Prabhupada's books, 
And then the Acharyas can help us understand Prabhupada's books more deeply, perhaps, if we take that attitude. We try to see their commentaries through Prabhupada's teachings, an example. And generally speaking, there is maybe generally many of the 10th canto, we hear devotees sometimes give class because they don't want to repeat the same thing that everyone else is repeating, so they study the commentaries in the 10th canto, and they come up with some unique stories, which isn't entertaining, but it's not really that important. We're not here to be entertained, really. We're here to understand the principles so we can apply them within our lives and become a pure devotee ourselves, not just sit there and be entertained by some stories. Because the stories are also nice, and they're examples for principles, but they should be seen in relationship to principles, not simply as opportunities to be entertained, something, something novel we never heard before. Does that make sense? Maharaj, thank you. The, there are, as you mentioned rightly, that uh, there are some sections of Bhagavatam, only the narrations are there. What's that? The narration, the story, the pastimes, like Tenth Canto you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is less application point, just we hear the stories, pastimes. Uh, yeah. Well, that, unless you have spiritual senses, you won't be able to understand what's going on. But there's, we can read them because it's part of the Bhagavatam. But we shouldn't think that because I'm reading them, therefore I become a gopi or something. We can appreciate. And if we learn how to read by going through the first nine cantos and we read with the proper attitude and try to actually experience what's going on to the best of our ability, with our spiritual mind and intelligence, then we might get something from it. Krishna will give us the intelligence, but he'll only give us the intelligence as much as we actually develop a sincere desire to serve the previous acharyas, and through them to serve all the devotees and the innocent and avoid the atheists. So to think we have entrance into the 10th canto just because we read the other nine cantos is not exactly the qualification to experience the 10th canto. It's the service attitude practically applied in our lives, helping the uh, loving Krishna without any motivation, without any material conceptions, serving the devotees as Krishna would want us to serve them appropriately according to the levels of advancement, helping the innocent people, becoming expert at avoiding the atheists also, developing a, a distaste from associating with them then gradually we'll become purified in our service. And when we read the 10th canto or other pastimes, we'll be able to experience more of what's actually going on. So 10th canto is our goal, but if we're not experiencing it when we're reading, then the other cantos will be actually much more valuable for us to teach us how to experience spiritual life, whether it be Arjuna and Bhagavad Gita or the Kumaras and the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, it's all a transcendental experience. And for us, there's really the ecstasy of the 10th canto. There's not much different for us between the ecstasy in the 10th canto and the potential ecstasy in the Bhagavad Gita. If we're not experiencing ecstasy when we read Bhagavad Gita, it's impossible that we're going to ex experience very much ecstasy when we read the 10th canto. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much for the presentation. I have one question. Uh, we study Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam, and uh, it should be some criteria uh, should be there how I can understand that I get something from the knowledge that I realize and can live the Bhagavatam in my life, that I can feel Bhagavatam. So you can how can you understand if you're getting something from it? Huh? Is the question is how can you understand when you read the Bhagavatam if you're actually making some progress? Yes. Yeah. Well, it says in the Bhagavatam how you can understand. What is that? Uh, 
bhakti pareshanu vyaktir anyatra trika ekakala praparamanasi tashnito sus tushti pushti shudapayanugasam. You know that verse? Yes, that that if we're actually just like when you eat a meal, with every bite there are three symptoms: there is growing strength, alleviation of hunger, and uh, let's see satisfaction. So similarly, by the proper execution of devotional service, bhakti paration uvyaktir then we feel growing love for Krishna and everyone else as they're related to Krishna. We're able to understand everyone and everything as they're related to Krishna. And we feel detachment from the things that draw our mind away from Krishna. So that's the symptom we're advancing. Thank you very much. Good to hear again. Those relate to bliss, knowledge, and eternity. If we're in eternity, we won't be attracted by the temporary. And if we get Paramatma realization, the more Krishna gives us intelligence, then the more we'll see everyone and everything in relation to Krishna. And when we do that and we serve with that vision, that inspiration, then we develop love for Krishna and everyone and everything in relation to Krishna. So that's Satchitananda. So if we're not experiencing Satchitananda, then we're we're still in material experience. We should at least feel ourselves going that direction. Yes. Uh, Marat, thank you so much for giving me an enlightening lecture. So much for giving me an enlightening lecture and so much emphasis given on the application part of the philosophy, transformation, realizations, experience of Krishna consciousness. So you spoke the verse from Bhagavad Gita, so just one clarity I want to have. <coughs> like in preface to Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada writes that uh, if even a one person become a pure devotee of the Lord, I will consider my attempt of opening this movement is success. So I just wanted to have clarity why, is there any, what are the reasons why Prabhupada write this, even one person become a pure devotee? Well, because Prabhupada wanted to make everyone, is, Prabhupada wanted to make everyone a pure devotee. But, if you can't make everyone, at least make one. You throw a million seeds onto the ground, you hope that at least one plant will grow. Otherwise, it's unfortunate not one plant grows after planting a million seeds. Okay, thank you very much. Grantaraj, Bhagavad Gita, Kijai, Srila Prabhupada, Kijai, Kaur Primanande.